Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about copyright clarity with Margaret Bryant. Copyright's definitely one of those things that becomes pretty overwhelming for us photographers, and Margaret helps break it down so that you know what you should do, when you should do, how it will protect you, and what happens if your work gets stolen. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. If you're a pet photographer ready to make more money and start living a life by your design, you've come to the right place. And now, your host, pet photographer, travel addict, chocolate martini connoisseur, Nicole Begley. Hey, everybody. Nicole here from Hair of the Dog, and I am being joined today with Margaret Bryant from Bryant Dog Photography outside of Dallas, Texas. If you guys don't know Margaret, well, you definitely should. She um, has been in the industry for quite some time and is a leader in the field. And she is also pretty experienced and knowledgeable in the world of copyright, which is what we are going to chat about today. So welcome, Margaret. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm glad to be here. Go oh, good, good. I'm so glad to have you. Um, before we dive into the world of copyright, go ahead and tell us a little bit about you and your business and background and how you got started in this crazy world of dog photography. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, for a very long time, had a previous career as a, uh, in broadcasting as a radio engineer. And uh, during that time, I started a photography business part-time. Actually, what, it, what happened was that my dog got involved in dog sports, fly ball particularly, and uh, I started photographing for myself. And this was back in the film days. And anybody who knows flyball knows that it's very fast. <laughs> and other people wanted me to, to, to photograph their dog too. And I learned in fairly short order that there was no money in that. And so I decided to start doing dog studio photography and started doing that after I think two years in and uh, have been doing that ever since. And so I am one of the few people who started photographing animals in the very beginning. Uh, I didn't start with something else and then change. I've been doing it from the very beginning and it will be 22 years. Holy this cow. Year. That's amazing. That's definitely well before pet photography was a thing. <laughs> there was only one other person in my market that I was aware of and they were doing all of the photo shoots at the pet stores. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's definitely... You know, I always like to mention, too, that everyone looks sometimes at, oh, there's so many competitors in my market, but that's not always necessarily a bad thing. So there's a lot of dogs as well. And I think that helps the potential clients even know that this is a thing. So back then when you started, you had to educate the marketplace that you even existed, let alone why people should choose to have their dogs photographed. Well, and and the funny part was that you'd get people laughing at you saying, you do what? Yeah, exactly. It still happens. I can only imagine back you then. You do what? <laughs> <laughs> That's but I funny. think then once they saw my work, then they were going, got it. <laughs> and let's face it, our clientele, for the most part, are people who dogs are their family. So yes, absolutely. they understand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That hasn't changed. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about, I guess, how you got interested in learning more about copyright, because I'm not going to lie. I am definitely one of those people you start to like look into it and then you're like, holy cow, my head's spinning. There's so <laughs> much to learn. So how did you um, dive down this rabbit hole? Uh, I dove down this rabbit ho hole actually a very long time ago because there was a time when I wrote music and I, even back then, this is way pre-internet yeah. and even back then people would help themselves to whatever yeah. they wanted to. And so since I knew my, my work was going to be performed on stage, I wanted to make sure that I was covered. And back then the copyright process was very, very different. And so I even copyrighted my stuff back then. Wow. So when I started doing photography full time, and even when I was still doing film, I was still doing copyright registrations, and uh, I've continued doing it. And it's uh, helped me a lot during some times when I do have problems with infringements. And uh, I think that all dog photographers especially should be concerned about it, or I should say animal photographers, yeah. because if you're talking about if you're a wedding photographer just doing family portraits, uh, people aren't worried so much about copyright because who's going to steal from you? They're identifiable pick people in right. there. So the only people you're going to have a problem with is your client, probably, and your client's family members. It's not like it's going to be taken for a commercial product or something like that. Uh, on the other hand, when you're talking about animals, they all look alike, right? Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, are. there's I feel like the yeah, people feel like there's a lot more leeway since you don't need a, a model release per se. They're like, Oh, it could be any dog. Yeah, I can Well and I was that. even thinking the the model release part is I was just thinking that, you know, somebody who is uh let's say a pet food manufacturer looking for some photography, oh I like this and they just think that, you know, all dogs look alike and yeah, right. well let's just use that. Yeah. And so you kind of have to be on your toes when you're a pet photographer because all animals don't look alike, and right. you own the art. You own the image. So, and we we definitely know our image. <laughs> the the first time you're scrolling <laughs> through, you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> yeah, I know that yep. image. Yeah, whether it's yours or someone that you know, and right. the photography, animal photography world is very small, and we look out for each other's backs. That's right. Yeah. So tell us, I guess, um, what is copyright? If we want to start there. So uh, copyright, most people don't know, was actually in is actually in the Constitution. So the founding fathers recognized even way back then that intellectual property needed to be protected. Now, of course, they weren't thinking about cameras then, but uh, it has come to be just about anything that is uh, some kind of a creation. It could be a sculpture. It could be a book, um, any number of things that it could be. And back then, they recognized the need to protect that. And so copyright is basically protection of your intellectual property is what they call it. And it gives you the right to control what happens to that intellectual property. So you alone have the right to copy it and decide where it's going to go. If you decide you want to sell it to sell it, if somebody's going to do a derivative work to, to do a derivative work, you alone have that, Authority, that, right to, yeah. that, that right to do that. Now, we could get into a whole separate thing about model releases, but for our for our yep. purposes with animals, that you ha- you hold the rights for that particular image to do whatever you want with it. Yeah, that's I had no idea it went back to founding fathers in the Constitution. Yep, that's crazy. So when when does your work become copyrighted? Is it when you press the shutter button, or is it later on? So it is when you press the the shutter button, uh, and whoever presses the the shutter button is the one who is actually the copyright holder. So yeah, if you're out on a vacation and you hand your phone to somebody else to take a picture of you, technically they own that picture, not you. <laughs> Do you remember that one? It was a couple years ago. The monkey that took a selfie. Yes. Oh, that <laughs> yeah. was a, that. Oh, you know when you, you don't want to get into that. Well, that's a very long <laughs> conversation about what happened with that. That's, that's the next podcast episode. <laughs> right. I was thinking of a different one, which was at the Oscars. Do you remember? Remember the Oscars where it was Bradley Cooper and Ellen DeGeneres and a whole bunch of people behind her. And no. uh, this was a, it was a group shot that was done just in the audience yep. uh, at the Oscars. And of course, those of us who are uh, copyright nerds, we all said, so who owns that picture? Right, right. <laughs> oh. uh, but anyway, so most people are uh, know that once you press the shutter, it's copyrighted. And uh, so that means once it's a completed work, whether that is pressing the shutter button or if it's a painting, once it's completed or a sculpture, once it's completed or a book, once it's completed, it's copyrighted. However, that's not going to get you too much because you need, if you want full protection, you need to register your work. And there's the little thing that gets everybody is that they don't realize you have to register your work for it to get the full complement of protection. Gotcha. So how do you do that? Or, or, and does it matter when you do that? Yeah, uh, all of that. Yes. Um, okay. So most people get into, uh, when they think about registration, they think, man, that's a lot of work and I can't be bothered and it's going to cost me money. And my comment to that is if you put it into your workflow, as I have, if you put it into your workflow, it's not really a big deal. And so you really must register your work before it, well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, you You must register your work, uh, ideally before it is out in the public and because You register it either published or unpublished, and you can't combine images that are both published and unpublished in the same filing. But basically what it is, is you're going to fill out a form. You're going to send them thumbnails, basically, of all of the images that you want to register. They have to be created by the same person, created in the same year, and either all published or all unpublished. And you pay them some money. And in a few months, they'll send you back a a slip of paper that says that they're all registered. Okay. Okay. And then who who manages that registration? It's the federal government and the copyright. How do you mean manages? Well, 
who, I guess, who do you register with? The copyright, U.S. Copyright yeah. Office. Okay, okay. And, and they've made it uh, more difficult recently, but it's really pretty easy. And there are lots of services that are online that will say, hey, we'll do it for you. Forget that. You can do it yourself. Okay, yeah. It's probably like anything. The first time you go through, you're like, oh, what am I doing? But then it gets a lot <laughs> <Right>. easier. <laughs> yeah. And Perfect. actually, the Copyright do- re- uh, Office does review all of the filings, believe it or not. And uh, if they have a question, they'll call you up or send you a note or something to say, hey, you know, I've got a question on this. I don't understand why you registered it this way. Okay. Do you pay per image? Do you pay per submission? How does that usually work? There are several different ways that you can do it. I happen to use the unpublished group of photographs and it's $55 for 750 photographs. Oh, wow. And then what what constitutes unpublished? Is that like putting it on your website? Is that no. social media? It has to be before that? Yes. Any okay. place that the general public can see it is considered to be published. And there is some controversy uh, and debate over uh, if you have a password protected part of your website where right. you will show your uh, images right. to your clients. There's a question about whether that's considered to be published or unpublished. Uh, if you really want to be uh, extra safe, you would just register it as published. I happen to think it's unpublished because it's not out there for the general public right. to see. Right. Now, here's a weird exception to that rule, though. Uh, and that is art galleries. Mm. So so let's say that you wanted to have a show at an art gallery. It's out there for the general public to see, but it's still considered to be unpublished. Don't ask me why. Huh. That's yeah. just the rule. That's the government. So, they have to throw in something like that every now and again. Right. So, <laughs> but so basically what it comes down to is if it's on your website, if it's on Facebook, if it's on Instagram, it's considered to be published. Okay. That makes and sense. And it's not a problem. Just you need to register it as published. Okay. Awesome. And then you mentioned before derivative works. What are what are derivative works? So derivative works would be if, let's say that somebody um, wants to paint a, do a painting based off your photograph. They need to have your permission. Okay. Okay. And so uh, it's not unusual for me to, uh, from time to time, to get people who contact me who know what the rules are and uh, contact me say, I want to do a painting of this this one one of your pictures. And, and I will say, um, usually I say, fine. Uh, and I will, I, and I've had some interesting people contact yeah. me. Uh-huh. I mean, like Wally Shiraz's daughter contacted yeah. me. It was really strange. It's like an astronaut's daughter contacted me. <laughs> um, and usually what I do is I just ask, I, I just want to see, you know, a the small version, piece. a website's version of the final product. That's all. Yeah. And I'll let them do it for free. You could charge for it, though, if you wanted to, because remember, it's a derivative work and you have control over it. Right, right. And I guess that probably would depend, too, if they're going to paint it and then sell it in like mass, you know, or versus right. if they're just going to paint it for their own enjoyment. And and that's exactly what I ask. And and a lot of times it's for a uh, painting competition. Oh, OK. So yeah. I, don't, I don't. That's fine. I don't care. Yeah, exactly. That's fantastic. So we have all our work. We're putting it out there. Eventually, I think it happens to all of us where we're like, wait a minute, my, that's mine. <laughs> that should not be used here. So what happens when you find out that your work's being used inappropriately, that someone has stolen a, one of your images? So here's the, the first thing that I recommend that everybody does is calm down. <laughs> it's hard. It's easier said than done. <laughs> I know that. I've been there. <laughs> I've had my work show up on the side of a building. I've been there. Oh, geez. <laughs> And uh, so, yes, calm down. So first you have to decide where was it, because that has a lot of bearing on what you're going to do. Yeah. And uh, so it's going to be how was it used? You know, where where did you see it? Had you already registered it? Remember, I said you have a lot more rights if it's registered versus if it's not registered. Right. And so uh, so, for example, if it is, let's say that somebody decided to use it on a poster advertising their doggy daycare. Yep or some kind of an ad for their doggy daycare. And so they're using it commercially. Um, If you did not register it, the most that you can ever go to court for would be whatever you would have charged for that usage. Okay. Whereas if you had registered it, you can go after whatever it would have been charged, uh, court costs, attorney's costs, punitive damages, you can go after a whole bunch more than than if you hadn't registered it. If you haven't registered it, it's pretty much not worth your trouble to go in court to co- going to court. I actually advise people unless it's a particularly egregious theft, right. it's not worth worth going to court because you have to go to federal court. And right. that's what 
right now until the CARES Act, which is another story we can get to at the end, until, I'm sorry, the uh, CASE Act, once, until that gets uh, passed, uh, you have to go to federal court. You're talking big bucks at that point. Yeah, but I've, you heard, do, I've heard it's about a $30,000 worth of damages before it's even worthwhile. It, yes, it can be. But yeah. you, there is one good hammer that you can have, and I've used it, and that is go to a copyright attorney. Uh And you tell and you tell them the situation and that it's registered and they will send this nice letter that Ah. will say that will say, you know, we look forward to seeing you in federal court. And that usually takes care of a lot of people. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep. Do you when you send that like the cease and desist, do you also like invoice them for their usage or it probably depends on what? So let's let's back up a little bit because there's more that before you send that letter, there's more that needs to be done. Okay. so uh, let's talk about how the what the infringement was. Okay. So if you're talking about your client just making copies, right? just talk to your client. Of course. Um, if you're talking about them using it uh, on online, you know, they screenshotted your uh, something and right. whatever. It's really not worth getting a, an attorney involved. Right. But if somebody is using it for commercial purposes, like let's say, as, as happened to me, I actually had another photographer here in town, a wedding photographer, take one of my images and put it on her website with her copyright notice on it. No. <laughs> so the first thing that I did, and I would recommend to everybody, is find out as much as you can about who did the infringement. So in this particular case, I did research to find out who was hosting her website. I did screenshots of everything. So I had rec- mm-hmm. uh, everything on record to, uh, to to go after if I had to. Don't immediately fly off the handle and send them an email or send them a letter. Right. Make sure you've got all your ducks in a row first. And so make sure that you know all about them, where their address is, what their usage has been, maybe even how long they've been using it, if there's a way of you figuring that out, and find out all about it and then decide what you're going to do. What you do at that particular point is up to you. I would always suggest that you write them a letter, a cease and desist letter, and I kind of make the assumption at first that it might be a, it depends upon the circumstances, that right. it might be an, an, uh, an honest, I didn't know, an yeah. innocent infringement. And uh, so I will, you know, and I'll just say, take it down. And, you know, so there's, you know, no harm, no foul here. Yeah. Uh, but if it's used commercially, that's a little bit of a different story because they should know better. Right, right. Especially and, a bigger brand. <laughs> yes, especially a bigger brand. So at that particular point, uh, you may want to talk to them about the fact that, they, you know, there's a problem. Don't give them an invoice yet, because let's say that it is a bigger brand. And you later decide that you need to have a copyright attorney go after them. You do not want to be limited right. by the, what your invoice is. So don't talk about money yeah. uh, right away because there is going to become a point uh, on all of these where you're going to have to say they're not still not doing anything. Let's uh, I want to go. I'm not going to drop it or I'm going to go further. Right. Right. And uh, so you have to decide, you know, at some particular point. And, you know, if it's on the web, there is such thing as a DMCA takedown notice. And that's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act takedown notice. And uh, what that is, is you would copy their, you would find out who their web host is and tell them there actually is a form to fill out. You want to issue a DMCA takedown notice. And no host web hosting wants to be caught with a copyright infringement case. Yeah. And so... Generally, that works, and and sometimes they will take down their entire website uh, <laughs> until it gets resolved. Right, right. Well, that's a good good to have in your back pocket. Well, and a lot of the thefts, a lot of times, are online. So yeah. And then, how does that work for if it's international? Because you know, online world is very worldwide. <laughs> yeah, you're pretty much out of luck. Yeah. Uh, so here's here's the situation. There is that while the United States and other countries are signatories to the Berne Copyright Convention. Other com- countries like China are not. Right. And so you're pretty much out of luck if it's in another country. In that particular case, I probably, if it's a if it's an egregious theft, right. not some little thing, I would probably go to a copyright attorney and, and say, you know, what should I do? And this is very important. Do not go to your regular business attorney. Right. You need to go to somebody who specializes in intellectual property because yeah. there are nuances there that a regular business attorney would not know. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, let's let's turn a little bit from copyright to trademark. Kind of what's the difference there? And does that affect us as photographers? Uh, yes, it does. So 
copyright is the intellectual property in a tangible form. It is, for example, uh, you cannot copyright an idea. Right. And, and some people think that you can. So, you know, when st- people started doing the, the dog catch, catching the right, food. Right, right. You know, you can't copyright that, that idea. Uh, the individual pictures, the photographs right. would be copyrighted and any terminology, uh, branding terms and that kind of stuff would be, could be copyrighted or trademarked. But uh, the actual concept, the uh, cannot be uh, copyrighted. Right. So yeah. trade, trademarks are marks that are used by uh, companies at, for branding. And okay. what that means for us is, and this came up with, I think, last year when people wanted to do all these photo sessions with a Grinch costume. Right. Well, the uh, Grinch is, is owned by the... Uh, the folks who uh, I think it's uh, Disney. Is it Disney? Did is they it Disney buy? now? Is it I Disney now? I think Disney might have bought them. I don't know. I'm okay. not sure. It's somebody In, big whatever. like that, though. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I used to work for Disney. <laughs> yeah. So I can I can tell you they go after people. They take their intellectual property very, very seriously, seriously and their licensing. Yes. Yes, very seriously. And so a lot of people feel like, well, nobody's going to know. Right. Well, I'm just a little old me in this little old town. Yeah. Right. Well, eventually they're probably going to know. Number one. Number two. I hope that your ethical values are better than that. Right. That you know that it's wrong. And so ethically, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. So now you have to explain it to your client. I had somebody, a photographer within the last week, ask me a uh, trademark question because their client had built a um, an oversized Barbie uh, display box, uh-huh. you know, like would be like the Barbie doll would be displayed in. Yep. And large enough to fit their little baby. Uh huh. And they said that, uh, you know, I, th- I had a problem with it and wanted to know if that would be trademark infringement. I said, yes, it would be. And he said that what he was going to suggest to the owner was, no, I can't take a photograph of that for you. But if you wanted to to put a make a Barbie frame to put my photograph in, you could definitely do that because then, you know, that's right. his thing and it's a private thing. It's not not commercial in any way. Right. But you have to be really careful about the the trademark infringement kind of thing because, you know, when you go into the grocery store and they make cakes and they have a, you know, Cookie you can monster. get a Star Wars theme <laughs> yeah. on it or you can get, uh, you know, any Disney theme on there. They paid for that right to do that. And right. that's how they can do that. You can't do that. So when I see all of these people that are doing Star Wars theme, and I don't mean just, you know, we're going to have a pretend lightsaber here. I don't mean that. I right. mean, as in they're copying the costumes and everything. Yeah, they're risking uh, trademark infringement and somebody coming after them. Yeah, yeah. And I think that what you mentioned before, too, even if you're, you know, a small business and you're like, oh, they'll never find me. The karma you're putting out there by not by purposely breaking the the rules and not following the laws on on how these are protected of other companies, you know, just how would you want somebody treating your work <laughs> and, and your stuff that's that's exactly. copyrighted and protected? So. I think what goes around comes around. Yeah. Um, yep. Affects us a bit there. And also, I wanted to touch base too on when you mentioned the trademark, you can't trademark, you know, a specific type of photograph like catching treats. Of course, yeah, that's not protected, but I think that becomes an ethical thing too of where is the line of, oh, I'm just copying this photographer that I admire versus maybe learning some different techniques and then mixing them with some other things and creating your own unique view on that image. Instead of just, you know, oh, I love this. I'm going to make this exact same thing. So I think that just becomes a something that we should all strive to do is to, to create work that's our own, even if we're I, inspired by others. I, I, I feel very strongly about the, the fact that it is very important to find your own voice. Yes. And uh, it is very important to set yourself apart from everyone else and that you have figured out what story that you want to tell for your clients and that that's what you are putting out there in the world is your particular voice and your interpretation. Because they could probably go to any other photographer saying, hey, I want to copy this. Uh, I like these with the hot, hot colors and the wide angle lens. And uh, right. we know who we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, everybody can do that. And yeah, I can do that, too. But that's not what you came to me for. You came to me for what it is that I do. Right. And right. I have my unique voice. And mine doesn't look like anybody else's. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, when we're starting, I think some of the challenges when people are new and they're learning, they're like, oh, well, this is what works. And this is what I like. And they don't they haven't practiced enough just learning different things to be able to mix and match and start to change things and make it their own. 
So they, they think that's the only way to go. But really, it's about just learning different techniques and trying different things. And if you want to try something to learn how somebody did something, try it, but you don't share it. And then, you know, just just always working on why do I like this image, but I also like this image? How can I combine all of these things that I like from all of these different you know, different uh, places that I'm inspired to create something completely new. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I'm off my soapbox now. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) Um, All right. So let's talk about websites and using other people's images or stock pictures on websites. How does that work? So you need permission. Yeah. (laughs) Quite frankly. Uh, And and I can't tell you the number of places that I have seen that you've got uh, Shutterstock's watermark across an image, it's like, sorry, you can't do that because, you know, that's that's stealing too. Right. Here, here's the thing that gets me is that the uh, some of the people that are the most upset uh, about their clients uh, copying their work uh, are also the same people who think there's no problem if I use somebody else's photograph, if I copy software, if I copy, you know, all of these other things, they think nothing of it. And they don't understand. It's the same thing. Right. It really is the same thing. And so there are, I I have some friends that uh, I I try not to come down on them. I don't, I want them to still be my friend. (laughs) Uh, But they know never to talk about copying things in front of me because they know that I will come back at them. Right, uh, right. And say, look, you don't have the right to do that. I mean, if you bought some software for somebody or some actions from somebody or backgrounds from somebody, they're for your use. They're not for you to spread around to all of your family or to yeah. all of your friends. Right. The one that used to make me crazy would be, let's say that there was a piece of software that was $300 and one photographer would get two others to go in and say, hey, how about we all pitch in a hundred bucks each and then we'll just make copies of it for each one of the three of us. And that right. way it'll save us all money. I'm sorry, that's still stealing. Right, right. Which I think is one of the reasons so many of these companies are going to a subscription model because... Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Can't complain about that anymore because no one played by the rules. (laughs) Exactly. You know, because there would be people, well, you know, Adobe's a big company. Microsoft is a really big company. You know, they're not going to know. It's like, well, yeah, with enough people do it. Yes, they will know. Right, right. And, you know, for when you purchase things too, like an action or, you know, templates or something like that from online from somebody, almost always it comes with a readme file in capital letters that will tell you the licensing agreement in there, tell right. you what you can and cannot do with it. And, right. you know, you can always, if you're unsure, reach out to the creator and say, hey, is it okay if I do this? Like maybe you purchase something and you have a team. So you have, you know, somebody else in your business that needs to utilize something. For instance, I had somebody in my academy that they have somebody that works with them in their business. And like, is it okay if they log in as well to see some of these things? Which, yeah, I just so appreciated them reaching out to me and just saying, Asking is, that this, question. is this okay? And when you reach out and ask, people are usually very lenient and say, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, you just use some common sense and ask and read, read, read the, the terms read, and conditions yes. with fonts, I imagine, too. That's a lot of, of issues of downloading fonts online. You were websites. going exactly where I was going to go next. <laughs> uh, so one of the things when you have so-called free fonts that are available, right? I always read the terms and conditions because a lot of times what it says is for personal use only, not commercial use. Right. I don't even download them yep. because if I'm using them in my business, that's a commercial use. Yeah. Or they might have them there and they just, you have to pay a license fee to use them commercially. Right. Yeah. And and if I, and if it's something that I like well enough, I will pay that fee so yep. that I can use them commercially. But I'm not just going to say, well, they're there and who's going to know if I use it on a couple of things in my business? Right. No, you have, I'm, I'm hoping that, like I said, that your ethics are good enough that you won't do that. Yep. Yeah. What comes around, goes around, comes around. <laughs> yes. You know it. Yeah. You know it. Awesome. So we've hit fonts, we've hit pictures. What about music and um, for <sighs> videos and slideshows and websites? Music is a really tough one because there are so many people involved in the, the music business. Right. So let's start out with saying, I want to play music at my uh, photo sessions. And can I play any music at the photo oh, sessions? that's a good one. And so right now there are, well, three come to mind. I know that there are more. There's ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. There are other licensing organizations besides those three, but those are probably the, the more major players. And uh, they came to an agreement that said that 
and I don't know what the number is, as long as your studio is under a certain amount of square footage, which probably most of ours would be, yes, you can play whatever music that you want and it's not a problem. But over a certain square footage, you have to have a license with one of the licensing organizations to be able to play the music. So people will say, well, you know, I want to use music with my slideshows that I sell during my IPS session. You need to have a license for that. Yes. I want to have a, I want to include, they're getting a DVD. Does anybody still do that anymore? Uh, Or a video (laughs) of some sort. And I want to have music with it. You know, can I just put it on there? Well, no. Well, so my client has this piece of music that they really, really like. Right. And uh, they're going to bring me the CD and then I will put it on there. No. No. (laughs) Because when you bought the CD, you were licensed only for personal use. This now becomes a commercial use. So no, you can't do that. Right. And so the easy way out of this is getting royalty free music. Now, what royalty free music means is that you are not playing, paying a royalty for every time you use the piece of music. You are paying one set fee and then you can use it as many times as you want within the parameters of the license agreement. Right. And I always recommend that to everybody because that's the easiest way. Because if you were to ever read the rules about music, you would go crazy before you ever finish them because (laughs) there's such a thing as public performance and then you get into the writer gets some and then the, uh, well, if you're playing a band that's doing it or a singer that's doing it, they get money out of it and the publisher gets money. I mean, everybody gets their cut. There's reproduction rights and there's, it's crazy. I read it and I'm going, okay, I'm not sure I even understand this. I'm pretty good with this stuff. (laughs) So it's just much easier. I would recommend everybody that you either have somebody in the family or a friend who writes music for you or you get royalty free music. Yeah. And there's some great places. I know Triple Scoop Music, um, Song Freedom, I believe. What are some other good places? Here's the problem with um, Song Freedom and you got to be careful of because if uh, so, that's popular music, right? The Song Freedom one. Okay. Right. You need to read the license. And the reason that you need to read the license is so many times they will say that the license is for six months. Ah, uh uh-huh. Okay. And so is your client going to destroy that video (laughs) after six months? Probably (laughs) not. So in that particular case, you probably won't want to license something from there because... You could do it for your slideshows internally you know, or yeah. internally or, you know, your in-person sales stuff. Right. But not anything that's going to be out some out someplace. Yeah. Yeah. I know I use the the royalty free for all the stuff in my business and a lot of slideshow too. creators like Animoto Now, a lot of those different softwares that we use to create our slideshows. I've actually partnered with somebody like Triple Scoop that has royalty fee free music that you can use in the slideshow. So you don't even have to purchase it on your own because they right. created an agreement. They, 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 under, they understand that you need to, yeah. to do that. Yeah. No, that's good. That's really, really good. Awesome. Well, so we understand a little bit more, but what happens with our clients? Is there a, a best practice, a best of way to, to educate our uh, clients? Yes. I think that you definitely need to educate your clients on what they can do and what they can't do. Now, I'm one of those photographers that uh, I will give anybody, if they buy uh, a large enough portrait, I'll give them a web, web-friendly web version. Mm-hmm. And when I say web-friendly, yep. the longest side is less than a thousand pixels and uh, it's watermarked, of course. And so yep. I will I will give them that if they spend enough money with them uh, or give multiple of them. I'm, but I'm not one who sell, sells all, you know, all of the digitals generally. Right. And so you need to educate them. So in, in my packet that I give them, my welcome, I call it my welcome packet that I give them when they've booked me. In there, it has a section about copyright. If I, I can always get a feeling if I'm going to have a problem with them or not whether I need to go into more detail than just having it written there that I actually need to go over it with them. So I, uh, but I wouldn't, I would uh, not hesitate to go over with them if you think they're going to be a problem saying that uh, the idea is make it readily available to them. Whatever it is Mm -hmm. you think they're going to want, make it readily available to them as affordably as you can afford, as you can do, because then they're not going to steal from you. And if you educate them, see most of the clients that I have, have a pretty good idea. They can't just help themselves to everything. So that's not right. uh, that's not usually a problem. Now there are exceptions. So I did have one that was very interesting. I photographed this guy's dog. What was the dog's name? I'll I'll think of it in a second. Um, yeah. And uh, it was an unusual name, and he had a great big you know necklace with a dog's name on it. it was a little tiny dog, and mm-hmm. uh, he he wanted to. He, there was a particular photograph that he liked, and he wanted to know if I would send him a 
a high res file of it because he wanted to be able to use it on his um, CD. Uh, no, a book that he was writing about about yeah. the dog. And first, I'm thinking, I said, "Oh, do you have a publisher for it?" Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, you have to be self published because I can't imagine right. anybody wanting yeah. that. But I had to educate him about the fact that that it wasn't that I wasn't going to just send him a file. If he'd like to purchase it, I'd be more than happy to do that. But I wasn't going to just send him a file. And right. of course, he hit me with a thing you always hear, but I already own it. And right. of course, he doesn't. No. <laughs> and so uh, I'm thinking on the fly and I came up with a, an analogy that I thought that he would understand because as I recalled that he was a musician. And so I uh-huh. said, so you bought a portrait from me and that's good for display in your home. It's not good for putting on the cover of your book because you didn't pay for that usage. I said, that's like me let's say you've recorded a CD of your music and I bought the CD from you and I take it home and I make a whole bunch of copies of it and I go to a flea market and I'm giving them away. I'm not making any money on it because I'm giving them away. Would you be unhappy about that? Right. And he said, yes. And I said, now you understand (laughs) because you sold that CD to me for my musical listening enjoyment, not for me to go out and make copies to other people. And he then understood at that particular point, and I didn't charge him a lot of money, and he happily yeah. paid it and I sent it to him. But it's right, a lot of times right. it's educating it in terms that they can understand. Absolutely. Yeah. They don't, they don't know the nuances of all well, of this. And, so here's, they really and here's the other often, part. If you yeah. say something like, well, I have to make a living too. Who's going to feed my kids? They don't care. Right, so don't, right. don't even get into that. They don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because from their perception, they did pay you to make that exactly. image, so they feel like they might be entitled exactly. to it, right? Exactly. Yeah. I get a lot with clients. Thankfully, I, I mention it. Well, I educate them. I, I have digital files available to purchase only those, but they're priced in such a way that it's a stupid decision to do so. So no one ever purchases right. them on yep. their own. They always purchase it with artwork and albums and whatnot. But I do have in my session agreement. I have a section on copyright there that they have to initial that section. Um, And then I also have when I deliver my products, I have a little booklet that I printed that goes over how they make copies if they want to make additional prints, what to look for. I actually have deliver the files digitally in a, a gallery that's connected to a professional lab so that if they want prints, they can print from there. So I know they'll look good. But in there, in that copyright section, I tell them about contests because yep. so many clients are like, oh, I have this great picture of my dog. I'll enter it in this and this contest. So, I, yeah. actually, I actually <laughs> have in mind that it actually says that you can't use it for, for a contest without permission. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other yeah. the other thing that I include in there too that uh, I don't know if you thought about is that I restrict them from use it, from them to sell it or give it to a third party. Oh, and and yeah. the reason for that is because there was one day when on a website I saw it was a, a small company that was selling dog stuff, and yeah. right at the top was my photograph, and I went to see well how did <laughs> they like, get oh. that and you know how right. did that all happen. And it seemed that the uh, the person who bought the original photograph was friends of this other person. And they said, hey, why don't you use this picture of my dog? <laughs> it's like, uh, no, uh, no. no. <laughs> so I always make sure that it's not only what they can use it for, but they cannot convey usage to anybody else, too. Yes, that's a good thing to add. I will do that this week. <laughs> All right. Before we finish up, though, let's jump back to the case act, because I know it's federal court right now, but hopefully down the pike, things will be changing a little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe. So <laughs> fingers crossed. Well, so the idea of the case act is they want to make it more affordable for people to be able to enforce their copyright. And so right. that you could don't have to take it to federal court all of the time. And so the various different organizations, uh, photography organizations have been working on this with Congress to be able to uh, come up with something. And they came up with something and it passed the House and it's missing passing the Senate by one vote. And oh, no. uh, and this would um, take care of a lot of things as far as, you know, making copyright more enforceable on a much smaller right. scale. And uh, it's one vote that's holding, holding it up. And at one point, PPA and some of the other organizations were trying to get people to write letters to this one particular senator whose name escapes me right now, but uh, yeah. who is not not willing to sign sign it. And if it is not signed by the end of this legislative session, it's dead. Oh, no. And they have to start over again. Oh, how frustrating. Yeah. And they've been working on this for a a very long time. Uh Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, the other thing that I wanted to bring up too was probably a lot of people heard about the whole thing about uh, 
the court case regarding Instagram. Oh, right. And all of a sudden people were worried about, oh, I don't want to put my stuff on Instagram. Well, first off, you should be protecting your work everywhere now yeah. by putting a watermark on everything. Yeah. It doesn't hurt to have everything, have your information in the metadata. But I will tell you that a lot of these organizations strip off the metadata. Mm-hmm. So that is limited on how much good that does you. But a watermark is always good. And put it in a place that's not obnoxious, but uh, it's is critical. obvious. Yeah. <laughs> it's yes. obvious. And so the whole thing about that was that somebody got sued uh, because they had embedded an Instagram photo. And the court decided that they were allowed to embed the, the photo. And of course, everybody thought was, no, that's wrong. That's, you right, know, right. they've gone back and taken a second look. Uh, Instagram has also changed their terms of service on there so mm-hmm. that it's very clear that the work belongs to the people who posted it. And that uh, the whole embedding thing is now going back to court. And we're hoping for a more satisfactory response response from the judge, maybe a judge who knows something about intellectual property, yeah. uh, that um, that outcome might be better. So stay tuned because the uh, the whole Instagram embed case is not over. Mm, okay. All right. Well, good to know. Thank you. This has been so, so helpful and knowledgeable. Is there anything else you want to add about anything uh, copyright? Fair use. Yes, I do want to talk about right, fair perfect. use. <laughs> Perfect. Fair use. A lot of people will say when they start taking your work and they'll say, oh, it's fair use. Uh, People will say, I want to use it for educational purposes and that's fair use. Well, if using things for educational purposes was fair use, there would not be a single textbook company in business today. (laughs) Right. 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 Uh Uh-huh. So here's the thing about fair use, though. Fair use is, is decided by the courts, not by the infringer and not by you. Right. The courts decided. And unfortunately, the courts have been very erratic, especially in recent years. And so there are conflicting things, case decisions that you sit there and you go, well, was it fair use or was it was it was it was it not? And you're going, you know, you may need an attorney to be able to do that. But so it's a case by case basis. Okay, but people are allowed to use your work for criticism, comment, news reporting, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to talk about how was it used? I mean, was it commercial or educational? Right. Was it published or unpublished? Um, Was it uh, your work? Was it published or unpublished? A lot of times people will think that uh, if I change part of it, if I change part of it, then it's okay to use it. And that's not true either. That could Uh, be like a derivative, right? Well, I wasn't thinking that as much as, so let's say that you have, uh, you wanted to do an art piece where you've got this big white space and you've got a little dog down in the bottom right hand corner and people say, well, I got to chop off some of this white space. And so uh, it's it's not the same thing because I'm only using part of it. Well, the the important part of it is still there. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, that's the heart of the work. It was that little dog in the in the corner there. Right. And so, no, that's not fair use. And then they also want to know what's the effect of the uh, on the marketplace. I mean, are you going to lose money because somebody else used it? Right. And there are some artists, and I'm thinking about people like Jeff Koons and uh, Richard Prince, who copy people's work all the time and make changes to it and sell them in art galleries for lots of money. And they get sued. Yeah. And what people don't hear about is that they hear about some cases where they might have won some, but ultimately they pretty much lose all of the court cases and they consider paying off the infringement claims to be the cost of doing business. Wow. And a lot of times people don't know that. Yeah. Because they kept trying to say fair use and no, it's not fair use. Man. Again, that karma thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Well, yeah, you've given us so much to think about and to do for the takeaways. I definitely see a couple of them. Number one, always read those terms and conditions in your terms of service. And, um, you know, just because you have it doesn't mean that it can be shared. And number two, it is 100% worth the effort to learn how to start copywriting your work and registering, registering, registering mm-hmm. your work. Where is there a good resource to to learn how to submit for registration anywhere? Does uh, do they, they walk you through it on the website at all? They actually do walk you through it on the website. I have to be honest, I've never read it. <laughs> right, right, right. Been doing uh, it for a while, so you I've been doing it to. for a while. And every, and every time they make, I think I've looked at it times when they've made changes because they. It used to be you just had to upload, uh, fill out the form, and upload your uh, images. And your images are called the deposit to make it more yeah, confusing. Right, of course, it's the deposit. <laughs> um, nowadays, now what they have you do is you have to give them an itemized list 
of the images that are in the deposit. Mm, and okay. uh, so if anybody is really interested in, in it, I would be happy to do a video or something on it or something for you or whatever. Oh, that would be amazing. Uh, to we do can... that because, yep. because it's really easier than it sounds. Yeah. And there are some rules you have to follow, yep. but it's really easier than it, than it sounds. Yeah, I think so. that's one reason a lot of people don't do it is they're just so overwhelmed with the thought of it that they don't even know where to start. So well, the other thing, the other thing, the other thing that I hear too is that people will say that why should I bother to do it because I won't collect anything anyway. Right. Well, and that's the reason for the whole case act thing because yes, there's a certain amount of truth behind that. But right. I have been, I've heard many times, and I and I've been told this that uh, a lot of times, if you were to write the letter, for example, to say cease and desist, they won't listen to you. Right. But if you have an attorney write that right. letter, yes, they'll listen to you then. Uh huh. <laughs> and of course, the attorney is not going to help you out. Unless you it's probably, registered. unless you've registered your work, because when I went to an attorney with a, when I had the problem with the image on the side of the building, uh -huh. I went to an attorney, and the very first question he asked him, "Did you register it?" And I said, "Yes," and I proved it to him. Yeah, he goes, "Okay, let's go." Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that would be great if you could record something. We'll make it a blog post, and we'll link it up um, for this to this podcast so that people can can see how easy it is and can get started doing that. It will help the whole industry. <laughs> 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 thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, where can people find you? Where can people follow along with you and, and see your work? And yeah, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of uh, redoing my website because right now my website looks antiquated. Most uh, things happen and, quickly. I mean, you blink and you're yeah. like, oh, man, I need to update my website. Yeah, <laughs> well, I've needed to update it for a long time, but now I'm, I'm really going to do it this time. But my website is bryantdogphotography.com. I also do um, workshops yep. uh, and I'm on Instagram. Uh, I wish I could say that I came up with a real clever name for Instagram, but I hadn't really planned on what it turned into. And so it's just... Margaret underscore Bryant 2014. That's all that it is <laughs> because and now it's like, it's too late to change. Right, it. Now everything's gone. <laughs> so uh, that's all it is. But I would love to have people uh, come follow me on uh, Instagram too. Fantastic. And then where for your workshops, where, um, what URL can they find that? Is that on your regular that is, website? Uh, uh, dog photo bootcamp. Okay, perfect. And you teach that with Kim Hartz, right? I do. Nice. Very I do. Good. And and we're in Tahoe next year if we can do it next year. We had to cancel this year, but <laughs> I know. we're trying again next year. I know. Third time's a charm. I'm on my third set of dates for Barklander. So wow. let's hope for next May. <laughs> Fingers <Yes>. crossed. Although, <laughs> gosh, with every passing week, I'm still feeling like, oh, no. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. All I could have been. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm supposed to be in Italy right now on vacation, but oh, wow. wow. It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you again so much for um, joining You're us welcome. and sharing all this incredible knowledge. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Hair of the Dog podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please take a minute to leave a review. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our upcoming episodes. One last thing. If you are ready to dive into more resources, head over to our website at www.hairofthedogacademy.com. Thanks for being a part of this pet photography community.